you guys going tonight? Any places going? We're dropping off some stuff at one of the local clubs. So oh, okay. Illinois? I'm sorry? Yeah. Does everyone still live in Illinois? No. I do. Oh, okay. Yeah. I didn't know if you, you guys were local or tourists or anything. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's in my bag. Do you have any idea on you? Yes. Go and yes. get it for me, please. Okay. Thank oh, you. That's not your wallet. Huh? Where is is it on the floor? Yeah. It's black? Oh, that's it. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Here. Step right there. Is anyone from Florida? No, um, we drove down here. My ID's Illinois, but I just moved here. Oh, you did? Yeah. Okay. Do you have your ID on you? It's Excuse in me, my sorry. bag in the trunk. Um, okay. I used to be a police officer. I'm just asking why everybody's been asked for the ID. If you stop. I'm just asking why everybody's been we asked. We just want to know who we're out with, that's all. Okay, because I am used to be a police officer, so I've never had to deal with everybody in the car getting their IDs ready. Yeah, we just like to know who we're out with. If it's just for speeding, that's what I'm trying to see what's going on. Like I said, we just like to know who we're out with. The officer requests IDs from the driver as well as the passengers in the vehicle. And the driver, who identifies himself as a former police officer, asks why the passengers are being required to show their IDs. Although the Supreme Court has not specifically ruled on the issue, lower level courts have applied previous Supreme Court decisions to conclude that passengers are not required to show their IDs or identify themselves during an ordinary traffic stop. For example, in the 2019 case of United States versus Landeros, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals determined that a police officer was not justified in extending a traffic stop because a passenger refused to identify themselves, holding that, quote, the officers insisted several times that Landeros identify himself after he initially refused and detained him while making those demands. At the time they did so, the officers had no reasonable suspicion that Landeros had committed an offense. Accordingly, the police could not lawfully order him to identify himself. To reach this conclusion, the Ninth Circuit relied heavily on the precedents set by two Supreme Court cases, Brown v. Texas, which was decided in 1979, and Heibel v. 6th Judicial District Court of Nevada, which was decided in 2004. In Brown v. Texas, an individual was arrested for refusing to identify themselves to police, and the Supreme Court found that, quote, to detain appellant and require him to identify himself violated the Fourth Amendment because the officers lacked any reasonable suspicion to believe appellant was engaged or had engaged in criminal conduct. Accordingly, appellant may not be punished for refusing to identify himself. The Heibel decision upheld Nevada's stop and identify statute as constitutional and further defined the criteria for when an officer has the authority to demand that an individual identify themselves. The court concluded that, quote, the principles of Terry permit a state to require a suspect to disclose his name in the course of a Terry stop. The request for identify has an immediate relation to the purpose, rationale, and practical demands of a Terry stop. A state law requiring a suspect to disclose his name in the course of a valid Terry stop is consistent with Fourth Amendment prohibitions against unreasonable searches and seizures. It's important to note that these cases all involve verbal identifications rather than situations involving police demands for identifying documents, and higher courts have yet to rule on this issue. However, in this encounter, it's clear that the officer had no reasonable suspicion that the passengers were involved in criminal activity, and a court would likely conclude that the passengers would have been well within their rights to refuse to identify themselves or provide ID. Okay, is there something going on in the area? Not that I'm aware of anything particular now. Okay. Okay. Because when you were coming toward me, I saw the light. It kind of blinded me. I thought something was wrong because I saw the light flash in my face. Well, I like I said, I visually estimated your speed. Mm -hmm. And at that point, I looked to see who was driving. Mm -hmm. Because let's just say, you know, a car runs from me or whatever. I want to be able to identify the driver. And I got behind you and pace clocked you. Okay. And that's why I'm stopping you today. Okay. Speed. All right. The officer claims that he flashed his spotlight at the driver so that he could positively identify him if he ran, despite the fact that the video clearly shows that he was not speeding when the officer shined his light into the vehicle. Shining any light into oncoming traffic can be incredibly dangerous, and many individuals experience discomfort and visibility reductions when bright lights enter their field of vision. This sensation is known as glare, nighttime glare, or disability glare. According to the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, quote, Glare reduces seeing distance because it causes light scatter in the eyes, which in turn reduces the contrast of roadway objects. The greater the intensity of the glare light, and the closer the glare light is to where one is looking, the greater the disability glare will be. Disability glare can impact an individual's ability to drive by decreasing the distance at which objects can be seen, and increasing reaction and recovery times. Because of the dangers of glare, the Florida Motor Vehicle Code repeatedly prohibits blinding other drivers with the various types of lights that can be attached to a vehicle. While Florida law allows motor vehicles to be equipped with one or two spotlights, Section 316.233 of the Florida Statutes requires that, quote, 
Every lighted spot lamp shall be so aimed and used that no part of the high intensity portion of the beam will strike the windshield or any windows, mirror, or occupant of another vehicle in use. Given the dangers and potential illegality created by an officer shining his spotlight into oncoming traffic, it is difficult to imagine a sufficient justification for taking that risk to identify the driver of a vehicle that was not violating any traffic laws. And it would still be questionable at best if the officer had a more compelling explanation for his actions. Where was your ID, partner? You it, in my bag in the trunk. In your bag in the trunk? Yeah. Okay. Where were you a police officer? St. Louis and the city of Atlanta. St. Louis, Missouri? Mm -hmm. And then again in Atlanta? Yeah, I moved, I transferred because I got I got tired of being in St. Louis. And what do you mean you transferred? I transferred, they were paying more. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was making What's like, uh, I was making like 38,000. Uh -huh. so and Atlanta was paying like 45. Did they take like laterals? Like, like yes. Any time for your yes. Okay. yes. Last what did you do about getting a certificate out of Georgia? Um, I after I got after I resigned, I didn't think about doing it anymore. No, I mean like how did you how did you carry over your certificate? Oh well, doing the ladder program, they just did their the accreditation from St. Louis Police Academy because you get the same credits as you do with them. So they have like an equivalency of training kind of thing. Yeah, I only did like eight weeks. Okay, okay. That's, that's what I was asking. I didn't know if they like honored it or whatever. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. How that works. Yes, sir. Okay. Who's that for? So how long were you? I had total. Um. St. Louis is about four and a half years. And what's your birthday? Atlanta was about four. Okay. What were your assignments? Um, 94. I, I did some intern in uh, car theft. Okay. And I did um, a little bit of homicide, and but mostly I just a B cop. Okay. Yeah. The officer asks the driver a series of questions about his career in law enforcement that seem to be aimed at validating his claim of being a former police officer, and the driver answers the questions without protest. While it can be a crime to falsely claim to be an active police officer in some situations, it ordinarily is not an offense to claim to be a former officer. In fact, impersonating a police officer laws generally require that an individual do more than simply claim to be an officer. Rather, an individual must take some action that is facilitated by their false status as a police police officer in order to commit a crime. For example, section 843.08 of the Florida statutes defines the criminal offense of false personation, stating that, quote, a person who falsely assumes or pretends to be a sheriff, an officer of the Florida Highway Patrol, a deputy sheriff, a police officer, or a federal law enforcement officer, and takes upon himself or herself to act as such, commits a felony of the third degree. Therefore, even if the driver had falsely claimed to be an active police officer, it is likely that he could not be convicted of false personation for simply saying that he was an officer under both the Florida statute and the requirements of the First Amendment. In the 2012 case of United States v. Alvarez, the U.S. Supreme Court found that the federal Stolen Valor Act, which criminalized lying about receiving a Congressional Medal of Honor, violated the First Amendment by unlawfully prohibiting speech. Content-based restrictions on speech, which criminalize mere speech because of its subject matter, have generally only been permitted for a few historic and traditional categories, such as obscenity, defamation, fighting words, and true threats. After reviewing the list of permissible content-based restrictions, the court observed that, quote, Absent from those few categories where the law allows content-based regulation of speech is any general exception to the First Amendment for false statements. The court has never endorsed the categorical rule that false statements receive no First Amendment protection. Our prior decisions have not confronted a measure like the Stolen Valor Act that targets falsity and nothing more. Applying this standard, the court went on to conclude that, quote, the Stolen Valor Act infringes upon speech protected by the First Amendment because, now quoting again, one of the costs of the First Amendment is that it protects the speech we detest as well as the speech we embrace. Though few might find respondent's statements anything but contemptible, his right to make those statements is protected by the Constitution's guarantee of freedom of speech and expression. The OPD officers had no reason to doubt the driver's story, and the officer's line of questioning may very well have been driven by curiosity rather than investigation. But even if the driver had been lying, he was well within his rights to do so. Thank you. I was just curious. Oh, no, no problem, no problem. Just sit tight, guys. As long as your licenses come back and valid and stuff. Okay. No tickets tonight. I don't want to like enjoy buying tickets or anything. I understand. I appreciate just it. Just one of those things. Okay. All right. Just sit tight for us. Thank you. You're welcome. We're just going to let you off with a verbal warning. Okay. Right. appreciate I'll... everything you guys have done, being cooperative with us. Be okay. safe tonight, okay? I appreciate Take it. Take care. No Thank problem. you. Have a good one. Good night.
After the officers checked the driver and passenger's IDs, he informed the driver he was letting him off with a quote-unquote verbal warning and did not issue a citation for the alleged speeding violation. The driver then resumed his trip without any further issues. Overall, the Orlando Police Department officers get a C-, because although they ultimately released the citizens without an arrest or citation, they recklessly blinded the driver of a vehicle as it was traveling down the road and unnecessarily compelled the passengers to present their ID. Not only was the officer's decision to use his spotlight on an oncoming vehicle dangerous and ineffective, but his reasoning for doing so is even more illogical. The officer claimed that the spotlight was used so that they could identify the driver in the event that the vehicle fled. However, the driver was not committing any crimes at the time of the officer's flash, and the officer had no reasonable suspicion that criminal activity was afoot. The officer's claim suggests that he intended to stop the vehicle before he used his spotlight, but it is unclear what, if anything, prompted him to do so. There is a strong argument to be made that the officer likely initiated a pretextual stop on the vehicle based on the observations made by using the spotlight. You are free to draw your own conclusions regarding the racial implications of this interaction, but it is extremely difficult to imagine a world where capturing a glimpse of a potential future suspect's face is a rational justification for blinding a driver operating a vehicle in an oncoming lane of traffic. The driver and passengers of the vehicle get an A+. Plus for remaining calm and collected throughout the encounter, engaging in a civil dialogue with the officers, and for challenging the conduct of the officers without becoming rude or vulgar. Although remaining silent is the general rule of thumb when navigating traffic stops, the driver's decision to challenge the OPD officer's conduct and inform them that he was a former police officer seemed to help this encounter reach a positive conclusion. The driver maintained a demeanor that was serious and skeptical while also remaining